Hello friends, good afternoon from Geneva. Today we are in conversation with Garans Fanny Upham, Vice President, World Alliance Against Antibiotic Resistance. She has been co-chief editor of the prestigious annual AMR Control and is currently chief editor AMR Times e-journal and e-newsletter. She has worked in infection control in Africa and is an ex-member of the steering committee Patients by Patient Safety at the World Health Organization. Garans, we know that 16th October is World Food Day. Is there any connect between antimicrobial resistance and food security? Well, there are many ways we can look at the problem. One of the things is that 80% of antibiotics are used for animal husbandry. In other words, to produce our meat and our fish, our meat in general, globally. So, antibiotic resistance comes from the food chain, as well as in overuse in human health, overuse in animal health, and in particular, from waste disposal, because when you dump antibiotics into the environment, as we all do in, in India normally, yeah. or because 90% of drug production comes from India. If we dump antibiotics in the environment, in the water and the rivers, if we dump animal waste, you know, the part that the industry cannot use into the environment, that's even worse because we're dumping biological material that already has resistance to antibiotics. Now, I came into the fight on antibiotic resistance eight years ago, uh, meeting Dr. Jean Carlet, and before that I was involved in tuberculosis and HIV for many years. We know in the case of tuberculosis, which is a bacterial disease, that we have had resistance to drugs for many years. And just after the UN World Health Assembly, the UN General Assembly on tuberculosis last week, we know that drug resistant, MDR, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis is a very big problem internationally. And that XDR tuberculosis is coming on the horizon. Now let me switch back to something. How is it, how is it, I'll be critical, that we do not talk about prevention? Because what's happening today in South Africa, in India, in Russia, all over the world, is that you have naive patients who contract drug-resistant tuberculosis. In other words, it's not like they didn't take the drugs. It's not like the doctors didn't treat them properly. It's that they caught a disease that is drug-resistant from contacts, could be public transportation, it's often in the hospital, in the communities, in the slums, and I would say globally we're doing very little on prevention and infection prevention control. The international community is talking about new antibiotics, talking about market incentive, investing for new antibiotics. But you know, I'll quote Dominique Monet from the European Centers for Disease Control. If we have new antibiotics and we don't deal with infection prevention control, it is like putting oil on the fire. You know, in 2008 at the WHO, a great, great uh, lady from Senegal, Awa Edara Kane, started the group Agizar, which is dealing with anti-microbial resistance in the food chain. That's the group that's dealing with it. And this year, um, with the WHO, they published the guideline on critical use of antibiotics. Uh, uh, last November. Now, let, it's very important to look at that, Aggie's are. Now, let me tell you a story that she told me, you know. She said, look, people think that they can be protected from AMR because they say, oh, I don't take antibiotics. They think at an individual basis. She said, well, I have news for you. For you. Tomorrow, you go buy tomatoes that come from Italy which has a lot of drug resistance. You can have the drug resistant bug on your tomato you're going to inject, you know, you're going to eat your tomato. Of course, what happens when you get into your gut a bacteria species that has acquired a gene of resistance, 
Well, the bacteria, they don't live as individual, you know, they don't follow the uh, ultra-liberal economics that we are taught, you know, they, they tend to act as a group. So bacteria will share, will share the gene of drug resistance, right? So you can catch, you can develop an, an infection from a number of bacteria that you have in your gut, could be E. coli, could be a number of bacteria, just because you ate a tomato. So it's, I think that EMI is not well explained to the public. People think that it's the individual patient who is resistant. It's not the individual patient, it's the bacteria. And the problem is we live in the world of bacteria. Some of them are dangerous to us. And the problem is that bacteria that can give you infections can share genes of resistance. So again, you can, nobody, absolutely nobody is immune, no matter how wealthy or how, uh, in what country you live, you are at the mercy of drug resistance via the environment, via the food chain, via an hygienic food chain. You know, there's been studies showing that, I think it was like half of samples of chicken sold in the supermarket in the U.S. had E. coli. So tomorrow, if you have gene resistance and E. coli, you know, it can spread, which is why, again, the G20 had a bower defense exercise um, this week uh, focusing on E. coli. Is climate change also impacting antimicrobial resistance in any way? Is it abetting antimicrobial resistance? Well, I can give you a funny example. I, I, I think you've all seen on television Hurricane Florence in the Carolinas, what the flooding it brought about. You have to know the Carolinas is the major <coughs> hog producers area in the US, so in the world. So they have very huge pig farms, huge chicken farms. And what happens with a pig farm is that the feces from the pigs, they put them out to dry in very, very big um, sort of uh, basins that are up, on, that are open. And when there was, the last was a hurricane in 2016, there was a law that was passed that demanded that the pig farm fecal recycling be covered and not open air. But it hasn't been acted upon by industry. So what happens this year? I can show you pictures. You have all the pig farms are flooded and that means we have E. coli, which is a bacteria that can give devastating diarrhea. We have E. coli in the water supply in the Carolinas. Okay. Now, the day before yesterday, the G20 was meeting in Argentina. And you know what they were doing? They had the health meeting led by Dame Sally Davis, who is a leader in AMR from the UK and they had a simulation of what would happen if we had a drug-resistant epidemic due to E. coli, and it became a biosecurity threat worldwide. So they were doing an exercise to know whether we could, in fact, defend our countries and our populations if we had a worldwide outbreak of E. coli. So you see, you have the link there directly, because what does it mean, climate change? It means, actually, the climate has always been changing, but there may be acceleration of climate changing towards heat, and in the past, been towards the cold. The fact is that you have more extreme weather events, like hurricanes, tornadoes, cyclones, and those weather events entail the problem of flooding, earthquake, tsunamis, and this means upsetting the, nat the, the environment, the water system, right? And the water system, the sewer system, is the major source of AMR worldwide. I was very happy to see um, a few weeks ago an article that came out in Planetary Health by leading authors who said, wait a minute now, if you look at the statistics, the the parts of the world that have the lowest use of antibiotics, like Africa, have the highest rate of resistance. Why is it? Well, they say 
the problem today is contagion. Contagion. In other words, AMR as epidemic is spread via two things. One is the environment, the water supply, the bad waste disposal polluting the water supply, the lack of sewer and sanitation polluting the water supply. And the other aspect is infection prevention and control that is very weak in health system. Now, to the extent we get more weather events, more extreme weather events, we're going to get two things. We're going to get thousands of people being uh, brought into healthcare systems. Because, you know, when they tell you there have been 10 uh, deaths uh, in Carolina, so 37 deaths, I think, uh, today, you can add a zero in terms of people who were affected by it. It could be 400 people ended up in the hospital. And of course, in the back of that, since the water supply is polluted, you're going to get thousands of people. If you don't have very good infection control, it's already the case that we estimate that about one patient, nearly one patient in, in five, sometimes one patient in 10 in rich countries do contract a hospital acquired infection. There's very little data on developing countries. It's just coming up. It's, it's beginning to come up. Um, officially, they say, well, so at least 10% of patients contract a hospital acquired infection. It's enormous, you know, 10% is enormous. But I myself was involved in studies in West Africa uh, seven years ago. We did a study in West Africa, and we found that 25% of morbidity and mortality among uh, women giving birth and babies, newborn babies, was hospital acquired infection. This was a con uh, study that we did on six um, African countries. So the figures for hospital acquired infection is much higher than what the hospital system recognized. Um, just as an aside, I was very happy to see a few months ago that India adopted a, a national infection prevention control policy document. I read the document, it's very good. But my friends tell me between the time when the state government agrees to something and the time each state, because you're a federal state, adopts it and then implements it. Because I can tell you, uh, participating in some of the experts meeting at the WHO, experts meeting from all over the world, that it is estimated that infection prevention control is always mentioned in national AMR plan. But there is very, very, very little in terms of implementation. So we're not focusing on the right thing, which is we need to really reinforce hygiene because otherwise drug-resistant infection will be spread from one patient to healthcare workers, to other patients, to other healthcare workers. And you know, to really understand, I mean, people see Ebola on the news, people understand well, any drug-resistant infection, whether it's antibiotic resistance, whether it's uh, antiretroviral resistant, you know, because like 17% of new cases in South Africa of HIV are drug resistant, right? We have that problem too. Malaria resistant, I mean, they may not be as contagious as Ebola, but the effect will be the same because if we cannot treat them, those people are going to die. But, but you are so very right, Garans. Now, uh, next month we have the World Antibiotic Awareness Week. What is your message for that week? Uh, again, infection control, infection control, infection control. <laughs> we need water and sanitation. Uh, you know, friends of mine, my co-vice president, is a, he's a, a specialist worldwide on infection control and he's a, one of the leader in infection control in France. And he was saying we have, well, we have made tremendous progress. And you have to know France is a very good country in terms of infection prevention and control, had been at least. He said one of the problems is that people in hospitals are not looking at fecal contamination and fecal threat. And the biggest thing that is threatening worldwide in terms of AMR is epidemic of anterior bacteria, in other words, bacteria that gives diarrheal disease. This is, this is an immediate threat because of antibiotic resistance. And what does this mean? This means that we are not, I say we, you know, globally, we have not paid sufficient attention to investment 
in proper sewers, potable water, right? And basic hygiene in hospitals and in the community. And my dream is to try to get an international movement on that because this is really the way to tackle AMR. And from there, I'd like to go back to the TB thing because, you know, there we have, we have a, a, a major TB problem with estimated 10 million cases a year. It's huge. Uh, you know, I attended some of the meeting preparing the Moscow summit on tuberculosis, and I was trying to put prevention <laughs> into the declaration and failed. <laughs> because the, the problem is that the way infection control is perceived today, and I just read the WHO document last week, huh, is that a case of, say, whether it's drug sensitive or, or drug resistant, uh, uh, tuberculosis is identified, particularly if it's drug resistant, you isolate the patient and you put the patient on treatment. And the fact that you start treatment on the patient means the patient is no longer contagious. But let me tell you something. It's not infection prevention control. It's imagining that you give the treatment to the right patient, right? So I'd say it's putting the cattle before the horse because we're not dealing with prevention. If you look at the pictures, there's a, there's a, a great picture of a tuberculosis dispensary from Pakistan in the WHO document, and it shows there's no airflow in the room, people don't have any mask, there's nothing to collect spit, spitting. So we're not dealing with prevention. You, you, you go see a major new hospital in France or in the US, you will see a very crowded, stuffy waiting room. No natural ventilation. You go to India, you find no natural ventilation. You go to Africa, you find no natural ventilation. And I have news for you. In 2009, the WHO put out a document, natural ventilation for healthcare systems. Natural ventilation is much cheaper and more efficient than very, very fancy negative pressure rooms. You know, so you can have, I'm not against fancy technology, don't get me wrong, but I'm saying that at the minimum, in poor settings, we should go back to the basics of natural airflow, which we knew centuries ago, it's part of human knowledge. You know, so if we want to prevent flu epidemic in the winter, and we want to decrease the risk that people contract tuberculosis, you know, besides building good housing, but that's my other thing, you know, we also need to have waiting rooms in which people are not crowded. We need to have natural ventilation, and it's not talked about. Infection prevention control is not in the document on tuberculosis. It's all in treatment. Well, I'm all for treatment, but we have to do prevention. Thank you very much, Garans. You've really hit the nail on the head, and uh, rightly so, because we are becoming so much treatment-focused, which is which is okay, which is in, in needed. But then we are doing it at the cost of prevention. And unless we prevent, we cannot get rid. We can keep on treating, but we will never be able to eliminate any disease or tuberculosis as the SDGs ask us to do so. And as all the countries have uh, agreed to it. And so I think that is a very important point which you have made today. Uh, friends, you were listening to Garan's Fanny Opem. Vice President of World Alliance Against Antibiotic Resistance or WAR with a triple A. And a WAR it is waged against the multi-sectoral damages caused by antimicrobial resistance.